Well, welcome to Cabbage 4 and 3 separation processes. Uh, you're all in the right place if you're still sitting down here. Um, my name is Kevin Dunn. I'll be instructor for the rest of the term. Today's class is really just intro, administrative overview. Uh, next class is where we'll start to look at what we're going to cover in this course. So today's class is really just fairly basic, uh, straightforward, and the slides are on the website, as you probably, as uh, some of you have seen, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So if you don't have these slides, they are available for you to download when you, uh, when you leave the class. Um, but otherwise, you can just pay attention to what's up there. So uh, administrative issues, and then there will be a small section at the end where we'll do some brainstorming just to cover some ideas of separation and for you to give me an idea of what you'd like to see covered in this elective. So it's, this is not a core course. You're here because you want to be here. And so I want to get some input from you to see where we're going with this course as well. Many of you have done co-op terms and have some interesting ideas of what you'd like to see. So we can certainly adjust the course content to, to fit that. Let's just give some background though. Uh, this course is not all my own work. I built on a lot of material that I inherited from firstly Santiago Porsche, who now works at Hatch. He used to work at Xerox. But he taught this course for three years in the department while he was working full time. So he taught it in the evenings. Uh, he got that material from Dr. Ghosh, who many of us had for the 3M course and some of the other courses. And then, how many of you are familiar with Dr. Dixon? A few of you, yeah. So, um, he taught the course since 1984, so he's joined the department. So, there's a long history of material here. I got all this material last year. I made some substantial modifications to the order of the material. I revised a lot of it. Um, so you guys are the second time around. But like I said, I'm, I'm totally up to changing the, the order of the course and the content topics, so um, it may not even be that you see everything from last year. But myself, I did my undergrad in Cape Town um, back in 99. I then came to Canada and did a master's in 2002, finished that up. Um, then I worked in the department and outside the department for a startup company until 2011 on data analysis and consulting. So it was petroleum, petrochemical, bioprocessing, uh, pharmaceutical, steel, metals, pulp and paper, a bit of a variety of, of topics that I worked on over there, and mainly data analysis and statistics. Then I worked at GSK for a year, mainly data analysis. And that finished June 2012, and then July 2012, I started here at Mac full time. So if you're looking for me to set up an off, uh, to meet with me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm in BSB, and I'm in the basement level, B105. The best way to set up a meeting time with me is by email. So that's my preferred method of communication. Uh, there's my phone number there as well. Dominic is our TA, so Dominic, uh, many of you have had him for 3K. Dominic's doing his master's with Dr. Adams. Do um, you want to just say a few words about yourself? Sure. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, my name is Dominic, so if you know me already. Um, in GHE 370, uh, the door to that major is usually locked, so yeah, feel free to send an email to me if you want to meet with me regarding the uh, course content, and I'll get back to you within about 24 hours or so. Great, thanks. Uh, Dominic is the only TA for this course. Those of you who've had my previous courses know that I give a lot of responsibility to my TA. So TAs are great, great your assignments. But that also means that when you've got a question on the assignment, that you go speak to Dominic about it. So if you don't, if you disagree with his grading, you go speak to him. It doesn't help to speak to me because he's great at it, right? So, so Dominic takes care of a lot of, of things for me in the course. Um, he really helps me out a lot, and, and my TAs my other courses help me out a lot. I give them a great responsibility, and uh, you guys are uh, it's totally up to you to, to organize time to work with TAs. Right? I'm moving away from having official office hours. What we found is that almost no one ever shows up for them, especially as you guys are in your fourth year, some of you in your fifth year, uh, with multiple programs going on. Um, everyone's timetable is out of sync, so there's no way that we can find common office hours. <coughs> so the best way to, to meet with the TA is just by organizing the meeting. Thanks, Dominic. <coughs> also about this class is um, 
I, I'm video recording it at the moment. There's also audio recording, and I post those on the course website, usually within a day or so. Now, there's no guarantee I'll always be able to do it. My video camera has broken in the past, or I may not have time to go uh, set it up in time for the class. So, not a guarantee that it will be available, but when, when I can do it, I certainly will. And that's there for you to use in any way you like. So, some people use it um, mostly to review the class. So, there's often times when the topic wasn't quite clearly explained the first time, or you weren't paying attention, um, or you had to step out of the class for a while, or you just had to skip the class entirely for a job interview, or whatever the reason is. Those videos are there, there to help you recap. Now, it's not the greatest quality. The camera's at the back of the class, and between me and the camera, there's a whole bunch of you. So if there's any talking, a conversation, the doors at the back opening and closing, that swamps out the sound, right? So it's not always the best, the best quality. And the picture quality isn't often the greatest as well, because mainly the technical reason is because there's such a white contrast here against the board, so the camera cannot focus clearly on both at the same time, so I've chosen the best middle ground settings, but sometimes you cannot see the detail on the board, and sometimes you cannot see the detail on the overhead. So don't rely on that to, uh, to skip lectures or whatever what other reason you might use. Use it primarily just as a reviewing tool. And from the course feedback I've received over the past four or five years, that really seems to be the way people tend to benefit from it the most. Okay? So, uh, so that is available there for you. The other thing is the course website is different. So I don't use Avenue for any of my courses. I use uh, these customized websites that are all based at learncheg.mac.ca. Um, that's the only way I will communicate with you in the course, is through the website and Twitter. But I will never send emails to the whole class. So anytime I'm making an announcement, I'll post it on the course website, and I'm assuming you are checking the website every day or every second day and keeping up with things. So I'll post a new assignment, I'll post solutions, I'll post new slides, I'll post the course project, I'll, um, I'll make, make announcements regarding the midterms and final exams, all through the website that is always on the top left hand corner, the, you'll see the announcement section. Now if you don't want to go, or, or you don't always remember to check the website, please feel free to subscribe to the Twitter handle there, Forum 3 Separations. Any announcement I make, I also tweet, so then you can get the announcement pushed to your phone. Okay, so that way you don't have to always be checking, um, and and you can you'll know right away when something new is posted. So as I said before, I'll, I'll be posting slides, assignments, solutions. I'll also periodically post various references uh, for you to read for admissions. Any questions so far on, on the websites or administrative issues? Let's talk a little bit about the course textbook and, and, and readings and, and what those are. Um, there is, in fact, no textbook for this course. I've looked at a number of alternatives. Uh, there's no single textbook that really works well that covers the topics we would like to cover typically. Uh, there are two good-ish books that cover most of the topics, but not everything. Those are the two shown up there. So the first one, Cedar, Henley, and Roper, is by far the more comprehensive of the two. It is not cheap. So I don't make it required because I'm not going to use the whole textbook either. So it's my, my approach is I'd rather leave it at there as a recommended book. You can check it out of the library, um, or you can, you can look at buying it, or whatever option you ch choose to use. The Gene Coppola's book you've used, I believe, in 3M. Is it still the required book three in the last time I checked? Yeah, so, so you may or may not have that book in uh, still. Wherever I do use that book, I will make reference to it. Or if the topic I'm covering, I may use another book as my primary reference, but it might still be covered in Jim Coppola, so I'll always tell you the chapter where you can go look at it. Um, so if you happen to have that book, um, it's, it's, it's still a good reference. A really excellent reference, though, that you must use while you're here at the university is we have the electronic subscription to Perry's through the library website. You can click on that link um, when you download these, the PDF of the slides. That link will work on campus, or if you use the access, you can access it from home. Perry's is 
is not a cheap reference book to have, it's probably also not worthwhile buying. Right? When I was in, in, in university, we were at the sixth edition, I think they're now at eight. So it keeps updating every five, 10 years. Um, you may choose to buy it at some point in your career or always um, use the electronic version. Most companies will tend to subscribe to that, that, that textbook as well. More, more, the bigger engineering companies will tend to have an electronic copy available. But here at the university, we have the eighth edition for you. Please, please make use of it. I will also reference it, um, and you can use it for some background reading for the project. Um, it would be a really good reference for that. Also, I will post references to other articles periodically on the course website. So sometimes the journal uh, Chemical Engineering Practice or Chemical Engineering Education or some of the various educational journals and ChemEng journals that I follow will post an interesting article on, say, membranes or cyclones. And then I will just link to that on the course website and it's for you to go read as background. Those articles are, the reason why I post them is because they're very practical. <coughs> they talk about how companies diagnose problems with the distillation column or how they have made gains by using a certain filter press. Right? So this is good background for you to have as engineers going forward. It's not part of the core course. I may periodically ask questions about it, but it's certainly good for you to have as, as background reading. So I suggest that when I post some references that you do, at least take a quick read at it and, and have it in your back pocket and, and, and just have it there for good. It's just good engineering practice that we keep up to date with our field. Right? So, so do that when I post them. The other tool that I use a lot in my classes to help improve things is I have continual feedback available through the website. So if you go to learnche.macmaster.ca slash feedback questions, you can post a comment, you can give me some feedback, you can ask questions through that website. You can choose to do it anonymously or if you provide an email address, I can reply to you. If you, if you don't fill in your email address, I'll still receive you whatever your comment and feedback is, but I cannot re respond to you. Okay, so this is good if you, if you want to let me know how things are going or not going so well during the course. Let me know, that way I can take action right away and fix it up for you rather than wait until next year um, and hear about the final course evaluation. I could rather do, do fix it up for you now than a year from now. Uh, then finally, let's just talk a little bit about expectations outside the class. Dominic was here earlier and he's the primary contact for any doubts and questions you have. Please email him and you're welcome to CC me just so that I'm aware of what your, what your concern is. Um, but primar primarily you should be dealing with Dominic. The other thing is, please email from your MAC address. I'm not particularly picky if you email me from your personal email address. But it does work a lot better if you email me from your MAC address because it gets filtered to the right mailbox for my computer and I respond a lot faster to MacMaster email addresses than me. Otherwise it just gets landed up in all my personal email from my mother and my friends and my partner and so on and I may not respond to it right away. MAC, at Mac stuff tends to get priority when it works, so I can do that. Now let's talk about the important part of this course, <laughs> the grade, which obviously you're all in it. Yeah? Now, for me, grading is just one of those things that we have to do, but it's also a good tool for you to see how well you've understood the material, right? And that's, that's why, we, why we have assignments, projects, and midterms, and final exams. But what I'm looking for, primarily, in, in the grading aspect, is that you've actually understood the concept. And secondly, that you've applied a systematic approach, rather than just plowing through equations and filling in numbers and filling up your page with material, which is unstructured and unclear, I'm far more interested in you demonstrating a good understanding of what we've covered. And the way to do that is by using a systematic approach. Now, many of you in the class have taken the 3K reactor design course with me. So you're familiar with that define, explore, plan, do, check, generalize strategy. Now, we will use that in other courses, we use it in 4N, I use it in this course, I use it in my statistics course, I use it in everywhere really. I even use it in my own personal life when I'm diagnosing problems around the house or troubleshooting issues. 
there's a reason for that plan, or for that strategy, and that's because it's well researched. Dr. Don Woods, who was a member of this department and passed away last year, but was here for 30, 35 years, did a lot of research around different problem solving strategies. And this is one strategy that works for engineering situations and otherwise. Okay, so we will use this when we solve problems interactively in the class. And I highly suggest that you use it when you're answering questions in this course as well as other courses and for the rest of your career. So we'll, we'll go through this um, as, an, as an example in many, in many instances in this course. But um, the basic idea is that you first define what the problem is that you're looking at. You write down what you know, what you don't know, what you're trying to solve, what is your objective. So literally state that. Now in many cases, if you've answered questions in other courses, you know that in your mind. It may be jumbled up there somewhere, but it's probably there somewhere where it's quite clear what you're looking to, to do with this question. But I would encourage you to explicitly write it out in this course. I'll talk a bit more about the explore step in a future class. <coughs> Very important to plan your strategy, even just a couple of bullet points on what you plan to do, and then actually go execute it. Right? So many of us jump in right over here. Right? And we do that day to day in our everyday life. Something's going wrong. We just like, I'm just going to go in and fix it right away. I'm not going to think about it. This seems obvious and straightforward. But it often isn't, and then we have to end up going back and wasting time and going back to the first step. Okay? And then the checking and generalization parts are also two other important aspects that I'll demonstrate in future classes through examples. So we will use this all the time, and I encourage you to, to use this in the assignments and in the projects and in the midterms and final exams. So that's what I'm looking for, is that you understand the concepts and you follow a systematic approach. I want you also, and this is where the A and A plus students are looking at, is that you can use this material for new problems, new instances, right? So can you apply the equations we learn in filtration theory to other units? We may not learn, and we cannot learn about every possible unit operation in this course. There's so many separators out there. But we must be able to apply it to new instances and new, um, new different technologies that come up in the future. Right? So we will, we will see that sometime. And sometimes the problems will be fairly open-ended, requiring, requiring you to think about it creatively and propose some creative solutions. But three and four don't show up all that often. Okay? So that they will, they will be there periodically. And then the other thing that we obviously value in the grading is, is accuracy. Numerical accuracy is is obviously important, but far, far more important than that is step one and two, that you understand the problem and that you can demonstrate a systematic procedure. Okay, that's really what we are looking for. In terms of the grading breakdown, um, my approach for all my courses is I give you multiple opportunities to show your understanding. So there's no single final exam that counts like a huge rack and just make or break in three hours. My approach is let's spread it out You've got multiple times to show me that you really do get this material. So there's five assignments in this course, 4% each. There'll be a midterm, there'll be a project, and there'll be a final exam. And then there's also these quest tests. So quests are a little new for you guys. Um, you may have heard about them from other students. I've used them last year for the first time in 4C3. All that there are is just short online computer-based tests that you write. And there's a there's a whole lot of educational research that goes behind them and the, the reasoning for them um, that I'll talk about at another time. But essentially they count a small amount of this course. They really are only there to, to, in, to, as a way to keep up with the material. And they're very low stakes and, and, and straightforward to solve. The course letters will be assigned using the standard system at the end. And then there's two important prerequisites you must be aware of. To pass this course, you must achieve 50% or greater in the final exam, and you must also submit a course project. So there's no trading off here, like, like trying to do really well in the assignments in the midterm, and then slacking off on the exam or the project is not an option in this course. Okay. So this is standard. Uh, through all the courses I teach, I have these requirements. Um, and, and they're never an issue. Like I've never had anyone fail the course because of this issue. If you're, if you're failing the course, you're failing everything. 
right? Um, so, so by and large, I've never, I've never had an issue with this, but it is there, it's important to know of um, as you're heading into this course. Uh, let's just talk about uh, further related to the grading. The midterm is 22nd of October in the evening. It's optional. If you don't feel like writing it, you don't have to come up. Uh, just come and write it, but your final exam will count more there. The quest tests I've spoken about already, they're there just for you to stay on top of things, and then the final exam will be cumulative of all the material. All my tests and exams are always open notes. You can use any calculator, any tools you like to answer those questions. Any concerns, questions so far? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. 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 Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute, yeah. How long is it? How long is it? It's uh, infinite time. Okay. Uh, October 22nd is during the chemical engineering conference, and so a lot of us are probably Okay, I may consider moving it, but it's really tough to, yeah. to try and do it, but thanks for bringing it to my attention. I mean, I'll see if I can shift it. It's, it's obviously easier to do it now than a few weeks from now. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So, it's a, also, there's, the, there's a short project that's uh, coming up. There's the way I'll run the projects this year is that there will be a choice of a limited number of units or, or areas of application that you'll be considering. I'll have a, a, an update on the website that tells you exactly what the scope of that project is and the, the length of and the requirements that that project is looking at solving. The handbook will be electronic and it's got several deadlines. One is you must notify me of your topic selection by the 4th of October or earlier. The outline will be due 15th of October. That's a graded outline that you submit that you propose what you plan to look at in that project. And then the due date is actually fairly early. It's 12th of November, much earlier than most course projects, which are then always ramped up at the end. And so my course projects are due about two, three weeks prior to the end of the term, then you can spend the rest of the term dealing with other people's courses. <coughs> The assignments are, and I encourage group work. Yes. Or the other good dogs. Yeah, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. So assignments are group based. In this course, I only accept groups of two. There will be no exceptions for larger groups. And I encourage you to work in groups of two. So find someone who you're comfortable working with. You may also choose, and it's quite acceptable to work on your own, but I do encourage groups of two. Uh, for, for some reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, well, actually, I'll talk about it now yet. So here's what I consider one approach of good group work, where two people collaborate on an assignment. They do all the questions on their own in draft. So you're going home at night on the bus or in the afternoon after this course, after the daytime classes are finished or in the evening. You work on those answers on your own, and then you meet up with the person that you're working with. So meet up in the library, at St. Morton's, or wherever you choose, and just compare notes with each other. That's the crucial part of this group work, is the comparison, and discussing one approach versus the other. If you're both in agreement, obviously that's great, right? But if you're in disagreements, that's where you really learn when you start to disagree with each other because then it's up to the other person to explain to their partner why they're thinking differently. And that's where you actually start to understand the material. If you've also both got the same solution, that also proves to yourself that you've both thought about it in the same way. Now you both may be wrong, but it's unlikely, but it's quite likely that you're both correct. Um, so that's what I call optimal group work. And then you go ahead and you can write up a joint solution. And there, if you choose one person to do some of the questions and the other person writes up the solution to the other part, that's okay. But it's, you're both <coughs> coming at it with the same thinking at this point when you're writing up the solution. So this is the least interesting part, is writing up the solution. 
the more interesting part happens over there when you do it on your own and then compare notes. What doesn't work and what most groups will eventually devolve into, and unfortunately, is that they'll assign one person to do some questions, assign the other person to do the other questions, staple it all up together and hand it in as one thing. Okay, so that's totally defeating the object of it. Many of you are smiling and you kind of recognize yourself in that position in previous courses. But it, it totally defeats the objective of, of the assignment questions. So, so aim for that, that group work strategy up there. If you're choosing to do the assignment on your own, you'll also never experience any of this up here, where you're challenging each other and, and thinking through the material. Okay, so let's uh, just before we go into the uh, brainstorming, I just quickly want to talk about the electronic document submission. So you're welcome to submit your documents electronically for the assignments, projects, and the, the, there's a bit of a discussion on that on the course website. So I will demonstrate it in class one day where, you, where I'll show you how to do the submission. There's also a video posted on the course website that you can go look at. Simply what it is is you, you can collaborate with your group member online using Google Docs and you can um, write up a joint submission that way and then you email that to the TA. And the TA will grade it electronically and return it electronically. So there's no paper involved, there's no lost assignments, uh, it's totally traceable to, to you. The, I will also state though that I will not accept Word documents as a submission form. And the reason is simply, uh, either Dominic, well, I don't know about Dominic, but myself, I don't use Microsoft Word. I'm not able to, to have it on my computer. I don't have it on my computer. So what I do encourage you is to either submit through Google Docs, an electronic document, or a PDF. Okay, but of those two, the most preferable is the Google Doc. It's just far easier to work with. Okay, there's a whole number of other reasons why I use that approach, um, but Let's just, let's just, if you don't choose to use either approach, if you don't want to submit electronically your assignments, you're welcome to submit assignments in paper form, if you choose to. But the course project must be submitted electronically. Assignments totally feel free to submit in paper, but I do encourage you to submit it electronically if you're, if you're comfortable with that. The electronic calculation of the Easter is uh, it has aspects of both, both calculations and and reporting. Can we do any calculations and scan it? Yeah, that, that's, and it that's totally an option. Um, though I, the online Google Docs has got an equation editor that's as functional as Microsoft Words. So if you're comfortable with Word's equation editor, the online one will work as well. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah. How many people can work in Google Cloud Project? Two. Two as well? Yeah. Any other questions on assignments, grading, projects? Okay, let's, uh, there's, a, there's about 20 minutes left in this class today. So what I'd like to do is, it's a short brainstorming exercise and it has, uh, the main aspect is just to get you kind of warmed up for what separation processes are about. The second part of the handout is where you get to give me some feedback on what you'd like to see covered in this course. Okay, so, You'll tell me about what separation processes you may have seen in a co-op term that you're interested in seeing more about. And I will then use that to, to structure the rest of the course. Now I've got a good idea of where I want to take the rest of the course. Um, and a lot, a lot of it was based on the feedback from the students last year. So I'm expecting similar feedback. But who knows, there might be some interesting co-op terms that uh, some of you have done. Interesting unit operations that you've seen that you'd like to see covered in this course. So there's one sheet of paper for a group of about three or four people. I only have 25, so that that's, that should be enough for the whole class. So group up with roughly three people around you and put in each box a separation step or a unit operation that begins with the letter A, B, C, and so forth. So for example, for D, you could put distillation, right? But try to think of something a little bit more inventive than that. Go through the whole alphabet with your group and see this. <laughs> Just shout out to me, letter A, unit operation. Absorption. Absorption. A, B, A, D. Uh -oh. 
Or absorption, adsorption. B. Is boiling a separator? Boiling? Okay. Maybe we have bag house filter, boiling. Any others? Biomembranes. Biomembranes. Shell press. All of those. Okay, good. C's. There's lots of C's. Cyclones. Chromatography. Centrifugation. Centrifuges. Any others? Coagulation. Coagulation. <laughs> so physical principle taking place in a separator for sure. Yeah. D's. Decanting. Dewatering. Sorry. Dialysis. Dialysis. Distillation. Yeah, lots of D's as well. E's. Electrolysis. Great. Evaporators. Extraction. Expanded bed columns. Okay, yeah. Pack bed. Okay. There's also evaporators, elutriation, anyone with F's? Flocculation. 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 Flash drum, filtration. Flotation. Flotation. Nice. G. No G. Gas chromatography, perhaps. We want uh, G, H. HPLC. <laughs> HPLC, yeah. Anyone else? Any other H's? Hemodialysis would be one, perhaps. Uh, I. Ion exchange. Ion exchange, nice. Anyone got a J? It's very juicy. It keeps coming up every year, J. Okay, so the only one I could find was jigging. Uh, if you look up, there's a separator, there's a jig separator. Anyone got a K? Yeah, no Ks. So there you go. If you invent an offer, a separation step, begin, make sure it begins with a K. Stand out. No adult. No adults. Liquid chromatography, liquid liquid. Liquid liquid extraction, leaching. Any Fs? Microfiltration membranes, that's an easy one. N. Nanofiltration. Keep pushing those membranes. O. Osmosis. Osmosis. Yeah, P. Pasteurization. Pasteurization, yeah. For evaporation, great. Pack beds. There's a mass transfer. Q. Ah, no Qs. R. Reverse osmosis. Sweet reaction distillation. S. Sedimentation. Sedimentation is a good one. Sequestration. Sequestration. Sedimentation. Is that a separation step? It's kind of like. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, supercritical fluid extraction would be another one that's there. T. No T's. T is a tough one. Tangential flow filtration, but it's kind of a lame one. Uh, U. Ultra filtration. Ultra filtration. B. Vacuum filtration. Vacuum filtration. Vibratory screen. W. Any X's? X is a Y. Yeah, I, I can know X is a Y. Uh, Z. Seaweed membrane. Zeolites. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see if I, I'll try to get the guy from the seaweed membrane, it's from GE, to come uh, give the talk to the class. He did last year, so let's see if we can get him back again. Okay, so that's super. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the wide variety of separators that we're going to deal with in this class. We'll pretty much cover um, one unit operation every week, sometimes a little bit more. Uh, so by the end of this class, you would have a good 13 uh, to 17, 18 unit ops um, under the belt, and you should understand what's going on. Um, there's obviously a wide variety more in practice. So 
what I'd like to do then is make sure that I get that sheet that your group uh, wrote on for the, the last part. I'm really interested in, in your, your input here. And then I will see you next week.